my question is, of course, the system is more resilient than you might think. Why would anything now break all of a sudden, right? Time. Time is the answer. Because we are raised in an era where we want everything to happen straight away, David. You know, rates are higher, something breaks now. People underestimate the time effect. Alfonso Picatello is back. He is the founder of the Macro Compass. We'll be talking about his macro outlook and his macro compass today. No pun intended, but we have a great show. A lot to go over all the way from the Fed to equity markets and Bitcoin. Alfonso, welcome back. Hey, David, always a pleasure to be here. But man, you're working so hard. I mean, delivering all these videos and all this content, it's uh, good work. I like it. Well, I appreciate it. It's because of amazing guests like you that uh, we have a good program. So thank you for being here. Uh, Alfonso, you have a new Bond course that we have to talk about. Um, very exciting uh, expansion from the Macro Compass. So congratulations to you as well. You've been keeping busy, I know. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about your Bond uh, macro outlook as well. Let's start by talking about recent news, the Federal Reserve. Um, no real surprises there from yesterday, or were you surprised by anything? Yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest revelation was that Powell said that in, uh, if you take the Fed funds and you adjust them by inflation, so that's something called the real Fed fund, as we can see in that chart, he wants that to be as high as two and a half percent positive, and he wants real Fed funds to be at one and a half percent at least or higher until the end of 2025, David. So that means we start today, we have Fed funds at 525, we have core inflation that is below four. So already today, we have policy rates in real terms that are almost one and a half percent. And we continue with policy being in real terms this tight until the end of 2025. So Fed funds rate will be way above the rate of inflation for two and a half years to go. And that is quite something, David. That is quite something. Why is it necessary to think about the Fed funds rate in real terms? Because the idea is the following. As an investor, when you need to choose, David, do I buy stocks? Do I invest in corporate bonds? Or do I just keep cash? If the real interest rate you can make on cash is positive, and it's good, it's plus 1%, plus 2%, without you taking any risk, any volatility, nothing, just keeping your money in a T-bill or in cash. When real rates are very positive, you are not going to be very aggressively investing in risk assets, are you? There is less urgency for you to go and look for risk and returns elsewhere when simply keeping cash is enough. So that means as an investor, you are going to be less aggressive. As a borrower, on the other hand, your life is going to be very hard because your borrowing rates, your mortgage rates are going to be high and they're going to be above the rate of inflation, which means your debt due, your liabilities, are going to grow and are going to be more expensive than inflation, than your wages potentially. So basically in real terms, borrowing is really expensive. So as a borrower, that's a taxing condition to be. As an, as, as an investor, you will not be buying risky assets that much because cash already makes you positive real returns. That's why the Fed thinks of Fed funds in real terms, because that's a yardstick. When this real Fed fund becomes positive and stays positive, there's a good likelihood the economy really slows down. Isn't that the impetus to a higher savings rate, that the borrowing costs are high, but the savings cost is also higher in the sense that you're probably better off instead of purchasing a second home as an investment, just putting that in a money markets fund? What do you think? Pretty much. So the housing market is one of the engine of the US economy, right? Not only in the US, but everywhere else in the world. We made these housing markets really big and systematically important. I mean, the, the Chinese housing market was $50 trillion worth because it started coming down at the end of 2021. So the real estate market is big. And 75% of the transactions in the real estate market, David, are backed by a mortgage. So people take on mortgages. They take on a lot of mortgages. Well, as you say, and correctly so, they will not be taking on a lot of mortgages if mortgage rates are going to go over 7% in the US. That's already happening. 
mortgage applications in the US are the weakest in 30 years. So people are not applying for mortgages. They're slowing down. They're not buying a second house. Instead, they're saving more. Or they're taking their savings and instead of spending them in real economic stuff, in stuff that makes growth become stronger, they're taking their cash and parking it in money market funds or in T-bills. The combination of no mortgages, no loans, no credit, and a defensive approach from investors generally slows down the economy very hard. So that's why real Fed funds, real cash rates are important. And historically speaking, real Fed funds above zero is already quite restrictive. Powell yesterday told us he wants real Fed funds above one and a half percent positive for two and a half years. I mean, the last time we applied a similar policy was 2006, 2007. That's when we applied a similar policy. At some point, we figured out it was too tight. And that was when the housing market broke in 2008, right? And I'm not saying we're going to have 2008 again necessarily, but I'm saying we applied the policy of that kind of tightness back when demographics were better. We had less debt in our economy. We didn't have a great financial crisis that left scars on the economy yet. We applied that real policy rate that is so high for so long, and still we managed to break something for good. And now Powell in 2023 is telling me he wants to do the same again. That was quite a surprise to me. Well, uh, Alfonso, here in Canada, we have, well, where I live in Vancouver, many people I've talked to have risen their rents because their mortgage costs were either variable or they had a fixed and then it ended this year, exactly this year, and they had to refinance and it's now double. Okay, so rents have skyrocketed. The average rent in Vancouver is downtown is around three thousand dollars for a one bedroom in a, uh, downtown. Okay, now uh, a year ago that was somewhere around twenty five hundred or even two thousand. It's a big increase. Are you seeing that in the data for the U.S. as well, or even Europe? Uh, so Canada has positive net immigration and a very strong one, David, which means people are coming in Canada, they need to live somewhere. So there is organic demand for people coming in and they need a place to stay. So Canada, because of this net immigration and scarcity of housing can somehow handle temporarily higher rents. So the equilibrium is somewhere found. It's a very fragile one. But if you go to US or Europe, the situation is a little bit different there. So if I take the US, the Zillow series of rent growth, which measures the actual rent growth on the ground, so negotiated leases, it's down to almost 0% growth year on year. So rents are not growing anymore, David. It's over. I mean, when uh, 12, 18 months ago, we had housing prices through the roof, very low mortgage rates, and people were buying houses to rent them out, and there was demand for rent, and the economy was strong, rents were going up. But now, rent growth has completely stopped in the US, completely stopped. And in Europe, it's a similar trend. So you're not going to be seeing um, rent growth uh, in places where this net immigration store is much less strong, particularly in Europe. Okay. Let's so go back to the Fed now. No surprises in their decision yesterday uh, to hold rates steady. Looking forward, Powell signaled the possibility of A, keeping rates higher for longer, and B, raising rates again, depending on the data. What do you think will will happen by the end of the year and into next year in terms of where the Fed funds rate will go? So look, if it's 525 where we are today, or five and a half if they hike again, it's, it's the, it, that's going to make the difference? Yeah, a little bit. What's going to make the difference is for how long is the Fed going to be keeping rates at 525 or five and a half? Because the bond market was led to believe by Powell in summer that the Fed would cut rates next year, would cut them strongly. The 2024 dot in the dot plot used to signal 100 basis points of cuts next year. And it's been cut yesterday to 50 basis points of cuts. So basically, the Fed is saying, look, we expect inflation to slow down, but we are not going to cut 100 basis points. At best, we're going to cut 50. And that is what matters for markets because the expectations for investors and borrowers, if you have to refinance your mortgage, David, the US doesn't have this problem really because a lot of people locked mortgages in for 30 years. 
And we should talk about it. This explains why the cycle in the US has been lasting so long and these macro lags are taking a little bit longer to, to kick in. But if somebody tells you, you need to refinance your mortgage in a year or two, and the central bank is signaling you're go they're going to be cutting rates, you're going to wait. You're going to wait before refinancing because maybe you get a better chance. But yesterday, the Fed came in and said, we are not going to cut rates. And that matters more. Let's talk about uh, the two things they look at, inflation and unemployment. So Jerome Powell said in regards to inflation, we want to see convincing evidence really that we have reached the appropriate level and we're seeing progress and we welcome that. But you know, we need to see more progress before we'll, we're willing to reach that conclusion. The conclusion being that inflation um, is, is under control. Uh, okay, is inflation under control? Because I'm looking at the CPI data two months in a row now We've had higher inflation two months in a row. That's three is a trend or almost getting there. Is inflation coming back? So if you look at headline inflation, oil prices are going up. What's worse, what's worse is that news of the day, and if they follow up, this is big, is that Russia seems to have banned diesel and gasoline exports. That is massive because of course, Russia wasn't exporting to Europe directly, but it wasn't exporting through other routes, as we know, right? To Latin America, to India, to all these other countries. And then these diesel and gasoline products were then somehow recycled and became fungible as well for Europe as well, through the back door, effectively, right? The moment Russia says, nah, we are going to limit exports of diesel and gasoline, then rest assured that Latin America is going to think twice before exporting on their hand as well, because they will need the diesel and the gasoline for themselves. So if they get less, they're also going to export less. What this means is effectively that prices at the pump for diesel and gasoline products might even get higher. This, this is especially true for European consumers, but second round effects also for US consumers. So that is reflected in headline CPI. These energy products get into the basket of CPI when it comes to headline and they push it higher. If you look at core inflation instead, David, and you exclude food and energy, you see some more promising trends. But if somebody would say, if you exclude everything from inflation, then you get no inflation, right? And that's a very easy game to play, but you know. Uh, well, yeah, course. Okay, we'll talk about core CPI in just a bit. It's been coming down, well, down, but just inching down. Okay, it's still above 4%. Um, yeah. Crude oil, $90 a barrel right now. I'm talking about WTI. Can we see 120? Look, $100 wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, you are in the part of the cycle where the physical market is very tight, uh, where you get indeed scarcity in these refined products, diesel, gasoline, stuff like this is, is very tight. Uh, you have seen Saudi Arabia cut supply, extending the cuts of supply in the market. So, you know, it's the part of the cycle where um, it's not uncommon to see oil prices rallying despite the economy weakening down. This wouldn't be the first time. Go and look at 2008. What happened there? Oil prices rallied in the midst of one of the worst recession in modern era. So if you think about it, oil prices are really driven by, to the core, supply and demand, physical supply and demand. And when things get too tight or too loose, you have a problem regardless of broad macro environment. So it wouldn't surprise me to see oil prices to $100. What that does is it puts more pressure on consumers and especially in places like Europe, that's really bad. What really is the uh, indirect impact of oil on inflation overall i'm talking about the services sector i'm talking about yeah. other other industries there are not many industries that i can think of and please correct me if i'm wrong that are directly impacted by the price of oil um, unless you're in transportation or trucking or something like that what, what's your take you mentioned them transportation is the big one that has a second round effect uh, directly from oil so the story is the following. Uh, if you run an analysis on the second round effects from oil prices moving its impact from headline to core inflation, you'll see stuff like, you know, a 10, 20, 30% move in oil has a 20 basis point impact on core inflation, 0.2%. So it's not very material. And this is why generally central banks will try to look through it 
they will say, yeah, oil prices are volatile, food prices are volatile. Uh, we'll look through it. We'll look on core inflation. The reality is that oil prices might be volatile, as central banks call it, but oil prices account for a lot of the ex monthly expenditures of consumers. So if oil prices are going up, prices at the pump especially are going up, consumers are going to feed it. They'll have less disposable income to spend. If their mortgage installments are also going up because their mortgage rates are variable, because their refinancings are coming soon, that is not the case for the US. So let's repeat this point. It's important. The US has a fixed mortgage market with on average a 10-year-plus tenor, even 30-year. So no variable rate. You don't get the immediate negative impact from higher interest rates. And also, you don't need to refinance anytime soon. So the US is relatively shielded by this. But go have a look at places like Northern Europe. Go have a look at places like, uh, I don't know, Sweden, UK, and Canada to a certain extent as well. You have more variable rate mortgages and generally shorter refinancing periods, three years, five years. There you're going to feel the hit, the combination of the hit in some places, especially in Europe, where they are a net importer of energy. So they feel the price at the pump even more, David. And on top of it, they have these variable mortgages or the short refinancing. Places like the UK or Europe are really going to do not very well going forward. Is, is, so I, I'm guessing the logic here is that shipping and transportation costs go higher, and that will marginally push up wholesale prices and feed into the rest of inflation, um, just marginally. Okay, so let's talk about, we talked about inflation from, from the headline side. Core side, as I mentioned, uh, sticky downwards, um, slightly down, right? It's still above 4% core PCE, above 4% core CPI, above 4%. The Fed needs 2%. That's still double their target. Uh, why is core CPE, or PCE rather, and CPI still relatively sticky despite this slight downward trend? So a big component of core inflation, roughly 40% of it, is shelter inflation, housing inflation in other words. So that is generally calculated as an equivalent of uh, rent inflation. Now, the problem with that, David, is the methodology of the calculation. So, as we said, negotiated leases on the ground are growing at 0 to 2%. So that's very low. But the housing inflation reflected in the official CPI statistics is still growing at 5 or 6%. Why is that? Because it takes a trailing methodology. So it doesn't account for today's leases but for the average of the last six to 12 months leases. So there are old contracts, which had a higher increase in rent six to 12 months ago that are still accounted for in the calculation. The moment they roll off and they are rolling off slowly, but surely the housing inflation part in the CPI will also adjust to reality, but it's a lag effect. It takes a little bit of time. So housing inflation, now you see it dropping a little bit in the statistics, it should continue to drop going forward. This will help core inflation to come down a little bit. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. And I'm also thinking, let's, which is leading to my next part uh, of the conversation, uh, is the um, tightness in the labor market also a contributing factor to this stickiness in the core CPI? Yeah, so there is a subcategory of core CPI, about 25% of it, which Powell watches really closely. It's called services X housing inflation. So that category, Powell watches it very closely because if you exclude housing from it, in core inflation services, you are left with the stuff that is the most closely related to the labor market, to economic growth. And so that part, services X housing inflation, has been coming down now. So that's been a positive trend for the Fed. It still remains though at these levels you mentioned year-on-year -year levels are three and a half, four percent 4%. So yes, it's been coming down from seven. Good news. But it's three and a half, and three and a half is almost double the Fed target. So the thing again is to slow down inflation, you need housing market to remain really weak, and you need the labor market to be materially weaker. That's the only way you're going to slow down inflation, David. Okay. Uh, true or false? Uh, notwithstanding inflation, so just you know, keeping that in mind, but ignoring that for this equation for now, the Fed needs 6% unemployment before they cut rates. 
make it five and a half, and I'm gonna say true. Okay. <laughs> you're a you're a hard negotiator. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but well, it's, that's still, it's a key point. That's still very high compared to current levels, yes. I mean, David, you're making a key point. You are saying that the Federal Reserve, contrary to any other point in the cycle, will be stubborn, will be very slow to understand that they're making damage. That's what you're saying. If you go back to 2018, do you know what took the Fed to stop the tightening and then cut interest rates in 2019? No unemployment rate spike. It just took the equity market down 20%. And they were like, what, what? Do you remember November, December, 2018? Big drawdown in equity markets. Apple down 20% in six weeks. And the Fed said in January, 2019, eh, sorry guys, we tightened a bit too much. Uh, maybe we should loosen a little bit. A few months later, they were cutting interest rates. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that area, just since we're talking about that, is because of the um, tariffs imposed by the Trump administration that severely damaged some stocks affected uh, by the China trade. So, so the so Fed, the Fed that, yeah, the Fed had hiked rates back then in 2017 and in 2018. We were with interest rates at about three, three and a half percent. So the Fed was hiking rates, hiking rates, hiking rates. We had tariffs. They were slowing down the economy. The economy was already slowing down. We are late cycle anyway. And then what happened is that the stock market said, well, we had enough. The environment isn't friendly anymore. We had a big sell off in November, December, 2018. The Fed immediately came to the rescue straight away. If you remember January, 2019, they said, we're going to pivot. We did too much. In 2019, the S&P rate 35% in a year because the Fed had pivoted very sharply. Why could the Fed pivot so hard? Inflation was 2%, David, 2%. It was very easy to pivot. Today, as you correctly said, the Fed isn't going to pivot very quickly. Inflation is still too high for them to pivot, which means they're going to pivot very late, which means unemployment rate will have to move higher before they actually cut the interest rates. Well, are you seeing any signs of unemployment moving higher anytime soon? Well, this cycle has been a really interesting one because if you look at leading indicators like housing, historically speaking, if you look at housing, when housing weakens, six, 12 months later, labor market weakens. Very simple to understand why, right? Housing weakens, construction weakens, no new brokers needed, no new furniture needed, and that part of the labor market weakens, and then everything else with it. Now, the housing market did weaken a lot in the second half of 2022, a very, very big drawdown in terms of activity, but the housing market didn't react. Construction employment didn't really fall. You want to know why? I think part of it is the fiscal spending that has been done. The Biden administration threw the equivalent of one and a half trillion dollars of fiscal deficits in the US economy. This is ridiculous. This is a pace of fiscal deficits in line with, uh, uh, I don't know, like a recession or something happening. But there was no recession yet happening in the US. So all that new fresh money, all that stimulus actually managed to held up the labor market. So all these relationships are not as linear as they were in the past. They have been very confusing at times. But now we enter the stage where the macro lags, I think, are more likely to kick in because now we are applying really tight policy. Powell is telling us, oh, we're going to do this for a couple of years to go. I mean, that's serious stuff. Okay. So conclusion is they will likely stay or keep their rates high for longer, uh, potentially too long. Is that is that your conclusion or no? Pretty much, yes. So the point is, the Fed is looking at the cycle and it says, oh, this labor market is so stubborn, it doesn't slow down. Oh, look at this. What we are doing is not even going to lead to, a, not even a recession, a blip in growth at best. So we have to do more. We have to do it for longer. We have to do it for two years. And I think this is prone to mistakes because policy works with lags. You tighten policy. It takes time for this to feed into growth. And it's really variable. Sometimes it takes 12 months. Sometimes it takes 24. But now, David, you're talking about doing this for three years, raising interest rates for the first time in March 2022. And the Fed is telling us we're going to keep policy very tight 
until 2025. That's what they're telling us. Wait, so how are they telling years. us that? How are they telling us that? Oh, with the projections, the real Fed funds that are projected by the Fed to be above one and a half percent by the end of 2025. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. But you have a chart here um, that you compiled. It says classic pause only lasts around five to six months before the Fed must cut rates. And you've shown uh, previous Fed funds rates aggregated back to 1984. And the median um, pause was around five to six months. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I, I, so, I, I've seen that. Yes. So <laughs> three years is not ordinary. This is exactly what I'm saying. I mean, it's like take any cycle from the 80s onwards. Go have a look and when the Fed hiked, 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 and then they said, enough, we're going to pause. Every time they said that, the median pause, you know, was five to six months. And then they were cutting. And this time they're saying, no, five to six months? No, no, no. We're going to wait for, I don't know, at least one and a half years to cut interest rates. You're like, sorry, but are you serious? And then they say, yeah, yeah, but we also see inflation slowing down eh, in 24 and 25. And still, we are not going to cut rates by much. I mean, this is quite a statement, David. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, look, I don't, let's, let's provide an argument here. I don't believe the Fed in their projection for three years because many people like you are projecting a recession by next quarter or quarter one, 2024, or Q2, 2024, a lot of Wall Street firms are pushing back the recession call to next year. All right, so let's say we get a recession next year. I don't think the Fed's going to wait another three years after that or two <laughs> years after that to cut rates if all of a sudden the economy slows down dramatically. Because keep in mind, they're still projecting soft landing. So their three-year out uh, projection for the Fed funds rate is based on the notion of soft landing, right? So I don't believe them. What do you think? Oh, I wouldn't believe them either. So uh, just as a reference, in October 2007, October 2007, the Federal Reserve was projecting GDP growth in 2008 to be plus 2%. Do you remember what happened in 2008, David? It wasn't 2% positive. It was much, much worse than that. So the Fed isn't good at forecasting, okay? That's a known fact. In 2021, they were projecting one hike in 2022, one. They ended up hiking by 450 basis points. So again, they're not good at forecasting. What I'm saying is they're telling us today that they will be stubborn. Contrary to the past, they are not ready to help the economy if needed immediately. What they're telling us is, well, we are going to keep policy tight probably for too long, probably for too long. It's not going to be three years. I agree with you. But they're going to keep it for probably too long. They're going to cause damage. They're going to make unemployment rate move higher. And maybe only after, so not proactively, but reactively, they're going to come in and try to rescue. And that's generally not a great strategy. Let's talk about market implications of this now, given that we know we've done analysis on where the Fed funds rate might go and where interest rates might go. Actually, no, we haven't talked about where interest rates might go. Let's do that first. So yeah. with the Fed funds rate staying high, what's going to happen to the 10-year? What's going to happen to the 30-year? So what we're seeing now is bond markets saying, well, you're basically forcing me to adapt to your own new view. So the, for, for in the beginning of the year, the bond market said, okay, you want to keep rates at 525? but I'm going to bet that you will cut rates in 24 and 25. So basically the five-year, 10-year rates, 30-year rates were markedly lower than Fed funds anticipating a solid cutting cycle starting from 2024. But now as the Fed has become really vocal that it's higher for longer, that they're going to be stubborn and they're not going to cut, David. Well, the bond market says, you know what? Well, then if you say so, I'm going to move these yields also at 10 year, also at 30 years, more in line with Fed funds. So if you have Fed funds at 525, then you start having 10 year rates at four and a half, for example, you get closer. So the cutting cycle is much milder that is now priced in. This is a this is generally tends to happen later in the cycle. When the central bank has been so vocal, higher for longer, the bond market almost tests the hypothesis. It says, okay, let's push these yields higher. Let's listen to you. Let's force these yields higher. Let's force them on the economy. Because when third-year mortgage rates move higher, uh, third-year rates move higher, also third-year mortgage rates are going to move higher. So we're going to go from 
six and a half percent to seven and a half percent. We're going to tax the economy more. We're going to make things even more complicated for the economy. Let's see if the economy can handle it. And very often, this is around the last stages of the cycle where we end up breaking something. It could be a pension fund model, a housing model, anything that relies on leverage, interest rates, it's prone to suffer under long-term interest rates moving higher so viciously as they are today. It's almost like a quest to look for what is the weak link in the macro cycle that will break. Will it break through higher oil prices? Maybe. Will it break through higher interest rates? Maybe. But the Federal Reserve, by giving this signal and by forcing bond markets to move these yields higher, is basically, I think, making things more fragile. It's making things more prone to an accident. Okay. So let's talk about what could break. Of course, nobody knows. We're predicting some sort of breakage. Um, <laughs> but uh, the housing market hasn't broken yet. People have anticipated that it will because of higher rates. All right. Um, the banking sector was kind of broken early in the year. The Fed later came to backstop any further breakage. Uh, the other areas that you talked about, uh, people's investments breaking while the equity markets have rallied despite higher rates. So all the things that people have thought may be breaking have not yet broken yet. My question is, of course, the system is more resilient than you might think. Why would anything now break all of a sudden, right? Time. Time is the answer. Because we are raised in an era where we want everything to happen straight away. David, you know, rates are higher, something breaks now. People underestimate the time effect. So if you keep rates higher for two months, what's the impact you're causing? Well, okay, if a pension fund is highly leveraged, is not hedged correctly, if a bank is not hedged correctly, then as we saw, you can have a problem, a temporary problem. If you're looking for structural problems, are you gonna have an issue from a couple of months of higher interest rates? How many people do how many people need to refinance their debt just exactly in those two to three months? Well, a small percentage of the population, right? Very, very small. Now try and do the same for two years, three years. What happens? A lot more people, a lot more corporate are gonna be called to refinance their debt at much higher interest rates. So you are covering a wider, more systemically important portion of the macro world through time. So that is the difference. And time plays around with people's mind. It does the opposite effect. If a recession hasn't happened in 2023, then it will not happen again. And everybody revises their forecast. No recession anymore. There was a survey run that said that 75% of investors now expect no recession at all in the US in the next 12 to 18 months. How, what's the percentage? 70%? 75% expects no recession in the US in the next 12 to 18 months. So time makes it so that people say, well, there has been no recession, there will be no recession. The contrary is that time actually makes a recession more likely if you keep interest rates higher because you are deploying this tightness on a, a larger cohort of the population. You're making more people refinance at higher mortgage rates. You're making more corporate refinance at the higher mortgage rates. Here, here's my here's my pushback, if I may. Self-fulfilling prophecy. If 75% of the survey thinks there's no recession, they're going to spend more <laughs> and then create no recession. <laughs> well, this was the uh, uh, a very interesting phrase coined by, I think, uh, Kyla is her name. And she's, she talked about the vibe session back when it was the opposite, when everybody was talking about the recession. It was back in September, October last year, right? In 2022, everybody was talking about the recession. So we are like pushing ourselves into it. This was at least one of the topics. And now you're saying the same, because everybody doesn't think we're going to have a recession, then we are not going to have a recession. We're going to spend more and stuff. I don't know. I just look at, at the financials. Like, um, European companies could borrow at 1.5% for 10 years. 1.5% for 10 years. This was the corporate borrowing rates in Europe between 2015 and 2019. You want to know what the borrowing rate is today? 4.5%. It's three times as big. So if your business model worked at 1.5, maybe 
I'm not sure if it works anymore at four and a half, David. And as long as you don't have to refinance, that's fine. But the longer you keep this rate at four and a half, the more likely is that more companies will need to check whether their business model works or not. When they figure out it doesn't, what's their choice? They need to cut costs. They need to lay off people. And so time is important because you incorporate more people, more companies into the process. Yes. Uh, and so what you're saying is you're probably, I'm guessing you're bearish on bonds overall if you think rates will keep going higher. So on bonds, it's it really depends on your time horizon. Um, for me, it's much easier to say equity markets, they have not much upside. I mean, you, you cannot expect equity markets to deliver strong returns going forward. The economy is slower than it was six to 12 months ago. And most importantly, the central banks are telling you, we are not going to accommodate at all. We are going to keep policy restrictive. We're going to keep these rates higher. And so that's not a good environment for equities. Is it a good environment for bonds? Well, until you break something, bonds will have a hard time rallying. So bonds will be able to rally and will provide you with a great diversification in your portfolio the moment that some big cracks are appearing. Because at that moment, you are anticipating the future cuts. You are a step ahead of the central banks, David. And then when you need, that's when you need to buy bonds in big size. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that uh, higher bond yields, especially on the longer end, usually are a signal for a stronger economy and stronger equity markets. In the past, we've seen a positive correlation between yields and stocks. And logically, it makes sense. People are selling bonds because they are more optimistic about risk. And so they're selling risk. Uh, sorry, they're, they're selling safe haven like treasuries. Yields go up. Stocks go up. It's not happening this time. So something that I explain in the bond market course is that when bonds are going higher, you need to higher in yield, you need to understand why is that. So you need to decompose the move in bond yields. If bond yields go higher, David, reflecting stronger growth, that's fine for equities. That's people selling bonds and buying equities because the economy is doing great. Growth is accelerating. That's not a problem. Equities do well in that case. Today, you're watching not exactly that happening. You're watching bond yields going higher, not because the economy is accelerating. I mean, the amount of job growth, for example, over the last six months is much lower than it was 12 months ago. The economy isn't accelerating as we speak. But bond yields are moving higher, reflecting tighter monetary policy. When that is the case, that's not good for equities because bond yields are moving higher for the wrong reasons. They're moving higher, reflecting tighter Fed policy, reflecting tighter conditions. And that is not an environment where equities do well. So as you say, it's important to understand why bond yields are moving higher. The moment you understand the drivers, you can also drive uh, your decisions in equity markets as well. Well, before we close on your outlook on the equity markets and risk assets, let's talk about your bond course for just a minute. So you recently launched a bond course. Uh, first of all, why have you done this? And secondly, what, what can we expect from this course? Well, I think the bond market is extremely important to understand for any investor. The problem, David, is that it's full of jargon. It's full of technicalities. People get scared out of the bond market. And I wanted to end that completely. I've been in the business and I can unpack all this jargon and technicalities for people so that they can understand how the bond market works. I want to close that gap in education that exists basically between professionals and people that are managing their savings and their investments. So that's the reason why I set up the bond market course. Um, can you give us a little bit more information as to uh, the, the curriculum? <laughs> sure. So we cover anything from the approaches to understand the driver behind the bond market moves, because that will help you understand what is really going on and what are the implications as well for equity markets. We're going to talk about the yield curve, for example. It's a super important indicator. So how do you analyze it? What does it mean? What is the relationship between the yield curve and growth? We're going to talk about corporate bonds as well. So the curriculum is pretty wide. It's about four hours of footage. People can see the videos, can download the material, and the material leads to more learning material as well. So it's a very comprehensive course. 
And actually for uh, people that are listening to this interview, I thought let's give off a nice 20% off. What do you say, David? Shall we do it? Well, it's not Black Friday yet, but we appreciate the front running. So uh, <laughs> 20% off in the code down below. All right, so let's uh, close off on stocks. Now, you have another chart here showing what stocks usually do in the EPS for earnings cycle. So in a bear market, it says in this title, stocks typically bottom before earnings do. Um, why is that? Is the stock market prescient in the sense that they, they kind of are predicting when earnings will improve? Yeah, so that chart is really interesting because people think that they need to wait for earnings to bottom before they can buy equities. Well, the reality is that generally speaking, if earnings are declining, then something is going wrong in the economy, which means the central banks are intervening, which means that stimulus, that liquidity is helping equity markets to rally, even before earnings actually pick up. Now, if we would follow that playbook, it would be perfectly on time today. So the, bond, the equity market supposedly bottomed in October 2022. Right, that was the low in S&P 500. I think it was 3,600 or something like that, okay? From that moment onwards, we have only gone up in equity markets. Now, if that is true, then you should have earnings per share bottom around now. It tends to happen nine to 12 months after. Okay, so many people are telling me, well, this, this pattern is being followed. So the, the equity market has bottomed because now earnings are also bottoming. Analysts are expecting 12% earnings per share growth next year, 12%. And in 2025, they're expecting 15%. So analysts are expecting a big booming growth. Well, the only problem is that I don't agree that earnings have bottomed. I mean, if you look at how expensive borrowing is and how the economy is slowing down. The fiscal tailwinds we have had in 2023, can you see them repeating again in 2024? We have a presidential election. These guys can't even agree on a stopgap funding for a month. I'm not sure that Biden can pull out another one and a half trillion dollars in spending next year. So those tailwinds from fiscal are not there anymore. We have higher interest rates, higher borrowing rates, a labor market which is slowing. How are we going to get the 12% earnings per share growth next year, David? I don't get it. It, it. It's possible the analysts you're referring to are looking bottom up and they're looking at specific stocks and they're predicting positive improvement and the, on the aggregate EPS gets pushed up. It reminds me of in 2011, I was back in school and we were analyzing some stocks as a school exercise and we were looking at an analyst report for a junior, junior uh, energy explorer company. The analyst gave it a buy rating because they expect the, the, the company to have better drill results, you know, micro, micro level improvements. Uh, they failed to predict a huge oil crash that year, <laughs> uh, which uh, in their base case assumption, oil was flat, if not up, um, and uh, that wiped out the stock by 50%. Um, so, yeah. That's, macro uh, very macro and bond markets, macro, this kind of stuff tends to trump the micro single equity analysis most of the times, David, unfortunately. So having a good grasp on macro and bond markets is really important. Um, bottom line then, okay, so we've talked about bonds, we've talked about your outlook on yields. You're not so optimistic about the stock markets just no. yet. Okay. No, I'm not does optimistic that, at all. Does that include the Magnificent Seven stocks, the exceptions that have pushed up the index? <laughs> Oh yeah, of course, they never go down, right? Uh, what's the new thing there? Artificial intelligence? Uh, so look, of course I'm making a joke out of it, but uh, the mania that has been uh, thrown in summer, especially around artificial intelligence was just another narrative to try and push the equity market higher in that part of the cycle. We have failed, I think, with that narrative. I mean, it's been fully played out and now we are reversing already. I don't think they're going to be immune from a uh, you know from this kind of cycle that awaits us where interest rates are going to remain high and the federal reserve is not going to be proactively easing they're going to be reactive they're going to wait for unemployment rate to move up before easing and that's not a good environment for any stocks actually out there uh well what about bitcoin because bitcoin so far has tracked stocks 
maybe it won't anymore. What do you think? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, okay, so Bitcoin wants animal spirits. It wants good stuff to happen. It wants, you know, this well, animal spirits is the right word. And I cannot see animal spirits picking up very fast with the macro cycle ahead. So uh, also you have a competitor out there, which is dollar cash. It doesn't make you amazing returns, but it makes you 5% a year. Um, when in 2021, Bitcoin went through the roof, you were making zero on your dollar cash, right? So you didn't have an alternative at all. You have plenty of animal spirits. And today you have an alternative and no animal spirits. It's a very simplistic assessment, but there are moments to go long Bitcoin and moments to stay a little bit out. And I think the market has been just hovering there, directionless for a while, which tells you something. It's a market that is driven by animal spirits. There are no animal spirits out there. So bottom line, how are you allocated? We don't have a quadrant <laughs> uh, uh, right now, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe we can explain it. No, but I am announcing next week, I think by the time the interview goes live, my forever portfolio. So that's an, basically a weapon that people can have to be allocated in a way that is prepared for different macro environments where you don't have to have the crystal ball. David, where you can allocate to different asset classes in a balanced way. So that goes out to subscribers of the Macro Compass next week, if people are interested. In general, if I would have to apply tilts to my allocation right now, there will be one which I'm pretty confident, is that you should lighten up on your equity exposure and you should increase your dollar cash exposure. This combination, I think, is relatively safe because the upside for equities out there is not large. And in dollar cash, you can make 5% anyway going forward. Later on in the cycle, you need to buy bonds with two hands. But you can't do it too early because central banks are telling us, guys, no way we're going to cut rates. No way. So only when we break something, then I'm going to buy bonds aggressively. What's the risk reward trade-off of cash versus gold right now? Oh, gold, that's a great uh, a great thing. I forgot about it. I like gold. Um, so look, people have been telling me, Alf, how can you like gold? I mean, real yields are so high. Uh, They're going to 2% real yields. I mean, if you plot a chart of real yields against gold, gold should be trading at 1,200, not at 1,900. So are you crazy? Well, shall I reverse the question to you, David, or to people who ask me that question? With real yields having been at 2% for so long already, why has gold still been trading at 1900? Are people stupid? Like nobody draws the same chart you and other 10,000 people have been drawing for years? So you should ask yourself, why is gold not drawing down, right? And I think the answer is more structural. The answer is foreign central banks that saw what happened to Russia, they've been thinking, okay, Maybe I should diversify. And when I say maybe I should diversify, I'm talking about a $10 trillion worth market. That's the foreign exchange reserves market, $10 trillion. If a small percentage gets allocated to gold, yeah, of course it makes a difference, right? Forget about real rate and this chart. If people are buying, if central banks are buying gold to diversify their FX reserves, it supports the market. I think the people asking you that question, we can close it off here. I think the people who asked you that question are probably thinking about um, the trade-off between risk. So when I buy stocks like like Apple or Nvidia, I want the upside risk. I also know it's gonna it could crash twenty percent in one quarter or more. It's but I want the risk. Bitcoin, same story. I want the upside. I want the risk. I'm not buying gold because I want the risk. Quite the contrary. I, I want a steady perhaps capital appreciation, but more or less to preserve capital. Um, but I'm looking to your point about interest rates being high and borrowers' costs being high, but savers', savers returns also being high. I'm getting similar risk by just parking cash, my money in cash, and collecting a steady high return. That's why we see an inverse relationship between yield and gold, because gold doesn't generate a yield, right? So what's your take on that? My take is that you should be a macro teacher of some sorts. I mean, you explained perfectly. Uh, this is generally why gold is inversely correlated to real interest rates. Because if you can get the same safe 
cash allocation into dollar cash at high real yields, why would you do it with gold? So they compete against each other, in other words. Now, the thing is that gold doesn't only have that property, David. Gold also has other properties. As gold, for example, can work very well in a deleveraging environment or in a recession. If you allocate into cash, cash doesn't perform positive, strong positive returns in a recession. Cash will always give you 5% until the Fed actually cuts. If you bought gold and you go into a recession, you can easily make 20 or 30% on your investment. So you get some of upside in gold rather than in T-bills, right? In case you get a recession, you get a much higher return. In case you get something funny happening on the monetary side, central banks decide to do a stronger allocation to gold all at once. You get that upside, which you don't get in dollar cash. So they start from a very similar position, but gold also captures a couple of different scenarios that dollar cash isn't capturing. So that is the difference. Very good. Well, where can we learn more about your work? We mentioned the bond course. So once again, click on the discount code below to get 20% off. Um, anything else we can get 20% off on, uh, <laughs> Alf, now well, that we're talking about discounts? <laughs> there's discount uh, in the markets, there's discount in bonds, there's discount in Alfonso's course. Today brought so, to you by discounts. I mean, uh, you can come here and I will uh, host you at my place and make pizza and uh, apply <laughs> you, yes. 100% discount. I'm from the south of Italy, man. I mean, no, no guest <laughs> ever pays anything here, so forget it. Uh, by the way, the 20% off for the bond market course is for the first 100 people. It's not going to last forever. So if people want to go and listening to the interview, they're interested, go and hurry up. It's 100, first come, first serve. The rest who wants to have a look at my other work, it's on themacrocompass.com. So you go there and you see a bunch of stuff from different years of subscription, different type of reports, uh, more information on courses, everything is in there. Okay. So follow, uh, what's the website? Themacrocompass.com. We'll put the link down in the description below. Make sure to click on the macrocompass.com. I appreciate the interview today, um, Alfonso, and I appreciate the invitation to make pizza at your place. Can I bring pineapple? No, and I'm never going to be a guest here anymore. No, just kidding. But there are a few rules. There are a few rules you can't break with Italians. It's impossible. Okay. No pineapple on the pizza with Alfonso. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Pleasure. Talk soon. And uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe this video.